It's the final hour of Overdrive on a Monday. Starting a new week with the Blue Jays off. But lots of baseball to talk about. We'll get into it with MLB writer for the Athletic Keith Law shortly. My name is Brennan Dunlop. Happy to be alongside Dave Festchuk. At least to start this week. we got a few days together this week, though. Yeah. Me. Looking forward to it. We'll see where the Jays are uh, come the end of that. Uh, I do love JP's musical selection, though. That's a very, like, baseball-appropriate song, which is one thing that f- people who, Blue Jays fans who have a, had the opportunity to go to Buffalo or maybe travel around to other ballparks, Cleveland, Detroit, mm-hmm. Fenway's a good road trip. A lot of people do the Bronx. You can, there's a different taste of what, like, baseball is and ballparks, oh, that ballpark yeah. experience uh, when you're traveling through the States. And I don't know if musically we kind of have that here. There's just this general stadium treatment of the sounds at Rogers Center, don't you think? Where it's yeah. like hype the crowd up, and it's like, but it's not uh, baseball music. You're right. Well, there's been a, there's been some complaints. We were talking about this. I don't know a couple weeks. Because ago. you're reading the X, is that there's why? Been, there's, no, there's been some complaints on on the X. Yes, <laughs> the app formerly known as Twitter. Uh, that's about it. that's how you got to say it. But the level of volume at the Rogers Center this season. Because to your point. It's like they're they're about the pump up music. They're about blasting it out of the right. speakers. Stadium bangers is the Yes, case bangers. Exactly. They love their bangers at the Rogers Center. And some people don't love the bangers. Mm-hmm. You know, Dave Hodge, our great TSN colleague uh, for many years, has complained about it. Hodge loves music, but you know, he's just saying that like, you can't hear yourself thinking there's something. It doesn't surprise me that Dave Hodge wouldn't like the bangers in a stadium though. That's kinda, yeah, I mean, and he loves a rock and roll show. Like, Hodge will go watch live music any day of the week. Is he going to see Taylor Swift at Rogers Center? That's a good question. That's the real question. Nobody can get tickets. No. Only no. diavero has got the tickets. 20 <laughs> Fingers is the only guy we know that he's, has four seats, and he's not giving them to us. So what do you think? Or to Hodge. Like, what do you think that is? Is that a facility thing? Or is it that the Blue Jays, you know, have a unique market, which it isn't? Yeah. It isn't. The same type of baseball market, not at all taking away from the, the baseball fans, from the diehards I love. One of the things I love most Great about fans here. going to Rogers Center, of course, one of the things I love most is seeing the classic, the vintage jerseys. Yeah. Like, is there an Eric Hinsky there? Is there it the, pe- the people who have the Cito Gaston jersey? Oh, yeah. Like, I love seeing those. But it is a very different type of baseball market where even just saying, what, like, what is baseball music? I don't really know. But, like, I think, like, Bruce Springsteen sounding music. Yeah. Whatever you just played to start the show, the segment, JP, that to me is like more of a baseball sounding music than Avicii or whatever house hits they're mixing in at Rogers. Right. You know? EMD or whatever. Yeah. EDM. EDM, whatever it is. I don't even care. <laughs> I like to sound a little dated. But no, you're right. And I think like, look, they're tr- like trying to make the place party central, right? They got all these party patios they've re- in the renovated outfield. Yeah. And it could, it should be a party. I get Bit of that. a nightclub atmosphere. You got the, the younger crowd out there, swilling, tall boys. You need some. You need some baggers. <laughs> uh, swilling is actually a great, a great term. That's a great adjective for consuming alcohol out of a can. Exactly. Uh, very good. I went to a, a Canadian Premier League game. Surprise, surprise. Um, this uh, past weekend, uh, Vancouver FC, the uh, the latest team to join the CPL. Yeah. Uh, and a derby against Pacific FC. So it's a it's about a forty five minute drive from Vancouver out to Langley. Okay. Uh, well worth it. Nice little ground, intimate. Uh, but a big win for me was not only were the tall boys uh, appropriately priced at eleven dollars, as opposed to fifteen dollars yes. at major stadiums in right. Canada now, uh, but they also had a five dollar deal on some craft uh, some craft brew can. Oh. Three fifty five mil for uh, for five bucks. I Give thought, me the discount beer, it's a please. Great way to entice people to uh, to drive out to Langley and enjoy things under the sun. But Love yeah, it. maybe they're making too much of a of a party at Rogers Center. But uh, I think Keith Law likes a party. He's an MLB writer for the Athletic, and he joins us on the line now. Keith, welcome to Overdrive, man. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Very good. We were just uh, debating how the the music at Rogers Center is different than it is in other ballparks across uh, much of Major League Baseball. And there's uh, I, I described. Baseball music, if I was to generalize it, as having a Bruce Springsteen-ish sound. Do you agree or disagree, Keith? I, I agree. <laughs> I'm not endorsing it. Same. Um, <laughs> See, I am the same. Yes, there you go. I am. My wife can't hear me. She's in a different room. I'm not a Bruce Springsteen fan. I might be the only baseball writer, certainly the only male baseball writer I know who is not a Bruce Springsteen fan, but I am not. <laughs> Uh, Keith, I'm not either. So we've already connected very well off the top here. Now, please tell me the Detroit Tigers, my beloved ball club, are going to turn things around and win something in the next couple of years. 
next couple of years. I was afraid you were going to say ne- I was afraid you were going to say next couple of weeks. And I was like, wow, this this has just gone completely off. The Not rails where you thought already. this conversation was going. Yeah, no, no, we, we no. Don't have to... I got to tell you, I like what they're doing. I like the lineup. Right, they're heading in the right direction. Riley Green has, I think, we can say that's his breakout season. Um, and he was one of the guys I picked for a breakout season. I think Spencer Torkelson is finally turning into something like the player you thought you were getting. He may never be a star, mm. but I think he can be a very, very good regular. I think you've seen enough from Matt Vierling this year to think he's a decent everyday player for you. I loved the first pick from the draft this year, Max Clark. I think he's got a chance to move somewhat quickly for a high school kid. It's going to come down to the pitching more than anything, and that is – a matter of getting healthy, obviously, because they're, you know, that big three they were supposed to have all been kind of racked by injuries. And they're going to have to do better at bringing in pitching from outside the organization uh, than they certainly than the previous regime had done. But that lo- the lineup looks like a foundation. And it does help that the bar is a lot lower in the AL Central than it is in the East or the West. Oh, that it is. We were talking about that at length a bit er- earlier. Uh, I'll take that answer. Very professional answer and some positivity for uh, those in Southwestern Ontario that's share the same baseball affinity as me, uh, but the Blue Jays this season. Uh, I'm curious your general thoughts and uh, if they are where you expected them to be or uh, what the shortcomings you're seeing are with them. They are exactly where I expected them to be, and if they were in the AL Central, they'd be running away with it, and I don't <laughs> think any Blue Jays fans would have a complaint. Uh, my friend Joe Sheehan, who, who has a baseball newsletter, email newsletter he's had for probably a decade now, he wrote a little bit about them the other day. The Blue Jays are exactly the team they projected to be, which is pretty good, and their fans are miserable. And I think that's probably pretty accurate because you've got the misfortune of being in what I think is pretty clearly the toughest division in baseball this year. And the Orioles are way better than I think anybody expected them to be. I think they're better than the Orioles people expected them to be this year. And it's just kind of the Blue Jays' misfortune where – there's a chance they have a really win 90 games and miss the playoffs, which would be loud for the team and for their fans. But I have a hard time saying it's a, a disappointment when this is basically who they look like they were going to be coming into the season. And if they win 90 games in spite of Alec Manoa being nowhere close to expectations and Vlad, Vlad Jr. being nowhere close to expectations, that's a pretty good outcome for the season. Well, let me ask you about Vladdy. I mean, you know, the, you say that the Jays have – you know, you know, perform to expectation, Keith, but I, I'm not sure we saw Kikuchi and Barrios being as good as they've been, although maybe you did. Mm-hmm. And I don't think mm-hmm. anybody, no. I don't think anybody saw Guerrero being as kind of blah as he's been given. It was only a couple of years ago. This guy was in the MVP conversation. It would have been the MVP in the American league, if not for Shohei Otani. What does this say about Guerrero Jr. right now? Like, is this is this just who he is? Or was that forty eight home run campaign sort of the uh, the outlier and what we've seen the last two years sort of more what we should expect? Or, or how do you project Guerrero Jr. from here on out? And I, I should just clarify too. I'm saying that the team as a whole is meeting expectations, right? But right. Rios and Kikuchi have been better. Manoa and Vlad Jr. have been worse. It's all kind of balanced down. Fair enough. I get you. I'm, I'm not. I just want to make sure just for listeners who, who sure. might have thought I was saying like every player, every single player has been exactly what I predicted gotcha. them to be. Yeah. I, I'm not quite that good. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not worried about Vlad. The guy still makes a lot of extremely hard contact. Those, there's going to be more 40 homer seasons. He's going to hit for higher average going forward. There are maybe some small changes to the approach that we're going to need to see. It might just be a function of just swinging it more strikes, fewer pitches out of the zone. He does still expand the zone a lot. So did his dad. I mean, this is what you, you know, Blue Jays have no excuse. They knew what they were buying when they, when they first signed him and he was 16. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the contact he makes is it's really good quality contact. Teams covet this teams pay for this in free agency. They go after it trades. They go after it in the draft. Very few hitters can match what he's doing for contact quality. I think it is a little bit of just bad luck and a little bit of, like a modest change to the to the approach to the pitches he's choosing to swing at, and next year he's a top ten hitter in the American League all over again. It is a little unfortunate that it's happening this year because if he has that MVP type year again, then maybe they're a ninety three, ninety four win club, and then they are definitely going to the playoffs. And it wouldn't surprise me if in the next six weeks he went on a you know a Julio Rodriguez type tear and did start producing like old Vlad because 
again, I just default to the, the underlying data that we have says, no, he's, he's still a really good hitter who hits the ball really hard. That's the thing we want most. What do you think about load management in baseball? Dave and I were talking about this earlier. Vlad left the game with a with a finger issue. Doesn't seem to be something serious, but you know he has not been himself. I kind of feel like the fact that the rest of the team is hitting or playing a bit more to their level than we saw three weeks ago, let's say, when the team was in mm-hmm. uh, a much different situation in terms of the playoff race. Like this might be a good opportunity to let him have a let him have a rest. But uh, what say you? I think it depends very much on the player. I hate the expression, by the way, because it sounds like we're running a factory. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, and these are actual people who look. Some there's there are Cal Ripkins out there who just don't need the time off and don't their performance doesn't dip even if they're playing every day. And there are some players who, for lots of different reasons, do need the time off or do need more careful management of their workloads of how much they're playing, of how much they're pitching. You know, I look at Vlad, who's going to have to work on his conditioning forever. Mm-hmm. Um, could he be one of those guys who benefits from a little more time off here or there? Or, or if, if he is he a guy who the less he plays the field, the better he'll hit because, I mean, he's obviously not a very good fielder to begin with, but also because it's just more work on a body that's always going to require maintenance for him. That's possible. I don't know him. I'm not there. But he certainly would fit the the archetype of the player who would benefit from having some time off every now and then, or from a change in role that, like I said, gets him off the field a bit more. But I do think it's very much player to player and teams that just try to do this with the whole roster are probably costing themselves because they're treating their whole roster with a one size fits all approach. And that's, that's very much not true. Cause like I said, we're, it's not a factory. These are individual people with very different physical and mental characteristics. Yeah, no doubt about it. Keith, blame the Toronto Raptors for introducing the load management uh, term <laughs> See, to the I vernacular. It's a basketball thing, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. No, it's all sports now. We talk yeah. about it with goaltenders in hockey. They do talk about it in yeah. soccer. But it was invented in Toronto. That's we right. That. Yeah, there we, you go. We, exactly. Yeah. Alex Blame McKechnie. Canada. Blame Canada Blame yet Canada. again. That's right, yeah. Keith. Love it. So let me ask you. Okay, so the so the, the Blue Jays are off tonight, Keith. They, they move to Baltimore for a three-game set against the AL East leading Orioles. What do you you talked about how you know the, the Orioles have performed well above expectation? They have the twenty eighth uh, lowest twenty uh, eighth of thirty payroll, seventy million bucks they're spending on this team that is uh, leading the AL East by three games, and their owner John Angelos has just come out and said, <laughs> "Guess what, folks? We're going to have to raise prices if you want us to keep all this great cheap young talent. You want us to sign all these guys? What did what did you make of that move? And is that maybe?" For Blue Jays fans, a great sign that no matter how the good the Orioles are, John Angelos will find a way to screw them up. <laughs> oh, I think he will, certainly. I mean, he's a, that is a lie. That is an outright lie. And I was very disappointed that that article, the author of that article, didn't push back. If someone says uh, something to you that, as you're a journalist, that is that much of an untruth, an obvious, obvious untruth. Pr- ticket prices have nothing to do with player salaries. We've known this for 30, 40, 50 years. That is an outright line. Not to mention that Orioles have been raising ticket prices as they've been slashing payroll over the last eight or nine years. So clearly these two things are not connected. And they clearly make enough money from their very lopsided TV contract that of course they could keep many of these guys. Maybe they won't keep every single one, but most clubs do, don't end up doing that. So Angelos is you know, on top of them suspending Kevin Brown, their TV announcer, for right. stating facts on air. Also, he is trying to engineer a big state subsidy to not just allow him, to allow the Orioles to refurbish the ballpark there, but to basically give them a bunch of free real estate around the ballpark so he can make even more of a profit off of it. Mm. And, and every time that guy opens his mouth, it makes something worse. And yeah, if you're a Blue Jays fan or a Rays fan, maybe you're looking and saying, well, the Orioles are really, really good and they're in great possession to contend for the next 10 years. But John Boyle screw it up. Like, <laughs> you know, he is the classic fail son that we've seen all over, all over sports. The, his dad did a pretty good job as the steward of the club and, and John seems destined to, to screw things up. And it's, that might be the only thing that can stop him because that club is really loaded. They've outplayed their runs scored, runs runs allowed this year by several games. But they still, even if you just go on what we call the Pythagorean record, you know what, they'd still probably be one of the three or four best teams in baseball. The lineup is loaded. The defense has gotten quite a bit better. The pitching is weak. 
Uh, but they did make a, a good move to go out and get Jack Flaherty to help the rotation down the stretch. They have more coming. There's more hitters coming. I think at some point, maybe it's this winter, if they package a few of those prospects together and go try to get an ace from somewhere outside the organization and make them even better for next year. Hey, looking ahead to the future, the Blue Jays farm system, uh, it's not exactly a strong pipeline that it may have been previous years, uh, certainly not amongst mm-hmm. the stronger ones in Major League Baseball currently. Uh, which players do you think Jays fans can, can be excited about in the near future? Yeah, it has thinned out. And, but I, I have to say it's also for good reason, right? You, they used a lot of those prospects in trades. I mean, they've promoted some, and they've used a lot of those guys in trades to go get players to help the big league roster. I mean, in the next couple of years, you're going to see Ricky Tienemann up somewhere. Um, if he continues to have health issues, you know, he might end up a reliever. I think he could be a very, very good reliever. That might be his role. I'm glad to see Aurelius Martinez has, has bounced back from an awful year last year where he was very young to be in double A. And, and it looked it. I mean, his, his approach at the plate was really poor. Uh, um, you know, I just pulled it up a 286 on base last year that wasn't going to cut it he has been much better this year at two different levels and it's allowed the the power which is going to be the carrying tool for him to really come through i think addison barger comes up and maybe fills the kevin biggio roster spot but does it better with better defense especially and i think he's a better hitter so you'll have a few of those guys coming up maybe none of them is an actual star and impact player the potential impact guys are further down including the guy they took in the first round this year arjun nimala He's only 17. He's probably several years away, but he has huge upside. I thought he was a top 10 talent in the draft, and for them to get him at the 20th pick seemed like one of the better bargains in the entire draft. So let's look at this uh, this race for the wild card, uh, Keith. When you, If you were sort of prognosticating here, we've seen Seattle go on this great run. They've won six in a row, and Julio Rodriguez is is raking in a big way. Uh, the Rays have got their problems at the top. It's currently sitting in the first wild card spot. Have got their problems with the Wander Franco situation and various injuries. Um, it's basically four teams. It's 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 Tampa, Houston, Seattle, Toronto. Four of the three spots. How do you like Toronto's chances? How do you see it shaking out? I like their chances to because they only got to pass one of those teams, or you know it could be the Texas is only three games up on Houston and Seattle, and if Texas has struggles over the last six weeks, they could easily end up outside. The Blue Jays are only four games behind Texas in the loss column. So I think if you look at it that way, they have to only pass one of all of those teams we've just mentioned and obviously continue to outplay the couple teams behind and the Red Sox are just a couple games behind. But I, I feel good about that. I feel like the Jays are, on paper, at least they're certainly better than the Red Sox. I think they're at least as good as a Wander Franco less raise. I think they're at least as good as the Mariners are. It's going to come down to a little bit of luck and a little bit of health, I think. And, you know, that's, I brought up that sort of possibility. Hey, Vlad's hitting the ball really hard. He's been doing it all year. He's not getting the results. That's the kind of player who goes on a Julio like tear for six weeks and carries a team to the playoffs and gets a bunch of MVP votes and all that other narrative stuff that I always kind of laugh at, but that's kind of how it goes, right? One player, one or two players play, you know, get, their luck turns around and that's what carries a team to the playoffs. Or maybe you're just the healthiest team coming down the stretch. There are enough things about this blue Jays club. The rotation's strong. Other than Vlad, I think the offense has been pretty much as, or even a little better than expected. It's very easy for me to see them, playing a little bit better in the last six weeks and that being enough to pass one of these other teams, especially with the, they're just one game behind the two teams in the West, Houston and Seattle. And mm-hmm. yeah, they're five behind Tampa Bay, but Tampa's probably going to be without their best player for the rest of the season and maybe beyond. Yeah. How vulnerable do you think the Rays are? Dave and I were talking about that earlier in the situation that the Jays are in now uh, where they don't have as many teams breathing down their necks as it looked like would be in this playoff race three weeks ago or so. Um, looking at the Rays, they seem like a team that's vulnerable. They were, and they were already vulnerable because look at what's happened to their rotation. I think three of the guys who were expected to be in their rotation, or at least coming into the season, are now out for the rest of the year with Tommy John surgery, mm-hmm. um, which obviously affects next year too. But just looking at this year, nobody can fade that kind of hit to the rotation. And the Rays are obviously have been doing amazing things with developing pitching, developing relievers and bulk guys to allow them to get by often with only three or four good starters going into a season. They don't even have that anymore. 
And yeah, I think that leaves them particularly vulnerable. I mean, it does mean when the Jays do get head to head series against any of these teams, they're chasing less so with Baltimore, more of these other clubs we're talking about. Any games they have left against them become that much more critical. And if you're facing a debilitated Rays team at this point, that's where you could do your damage. You can make up a lot of ground fairly quickly. And, and you know, it's not essential, but it feels pretty important knowing you're catching the Rays at a really fortunate time for you. Cause they don't have their best player and whatever three starters they throw at you in a series, it's not going to be like it was when they had McClanahan and Springs and Rasmus and et cetera, all of whom are on the shelf for the rest of the year. Keith, we don't get to talk to you too often. I was interested in your take on a team that has not uh, joined the playoff race after the trade deadline. And that is the uh, LA angels. What do you make of their situation, and what do you expect when it comes to the offseason and Shohei Otani is maybe the most coveted free agent ever in the history of this ever. sport? Yeah, I think ever is a good way to put it. I mean, I don't want to spoil my offseason free agent rankings, but I think he might be number one. I'm just going <laughs> to go out on a limb there. Yes. I mean, it, it is shocking to me. And I thought they had a good trade deadline, actually. You know, we've all criticized the Angels for a lot of things they've done. And obviously, you just look, and it's, what are they, 10 years since the last playoff win? Never a playoff appearance with Shohei. One playoff game win with Mike Trout. Mm -hmm. It's pretty embarrassing. Um, they they tried. It almost feel bad, right? You want to pat them on the head. It's a good job, guys. You really tried. It, it's not going to matter at all. And, you know, Shohei's he's probably going to leave as a free agent. Why would you come back? You've got to want to win at some point. I think he goes to another West coast team. And then if you're the angel, what do you do? You're just, you're rebuilding essentially without one of your two best players and trout is still great, but you've got to expect less from him in the future than he's given you over the last 12 years. Yeah. You're probably trying to figure out how to turn the roster over a little bit and, and thinking two, three, four years down the road, which is, it's just such a shame. I actually, I have to confess, I don't root for teams very much, but getting them into the playoffs in Shohei's walk year would have been a pretty cool story and I think would have gotten a lot of good attention, not just for them, but for the sport as a whole going into October. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so too. And, and I'm with you that I'm not a, an Angels fan or an Angels sympathizer, but uh, it is a strong fan base. It is a, you know, a, a team that's got some real baseball history and mm -hmm. they've been a, a part of this chapter in, of this incredible player's you know, a rise in Major League Baseball. And it really sucks that both uh, with him and Trout, they've not been able to succeed or anything. But uh, yep. Keith, well, let's see how the rest of the season plays out, my friend. No doubt we'll speak to you again soon. I look forward to uh, reading your pieces on The Athletic for the rest of the season and speaking to you again uh, at some point in the season, buddy. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Keith Law from The Athletic. You can follow him at Keith Law on The X. It's like, I don't even know how to use the new name of Twitter in a sentence. I Called know. The X? I don't know. This is keep calling it Twitter. Like, I mean, <laughs> does like, I mean, the thing about the X thing is like, like it was a great brand. Cause you could say, I'm going to send you a tweet. I'm going to tweet at you. I, this guy tweeted. Now right. you, you can't say you X. No, right? like, it doesn't I'm, work the same way. It doesn't, it doesn't flow in the vocabulary. It's going to X you. It's not a verb. Check out my X. Yeah. No, it doesn't, it doesn't have the same ring to it. I mean, if you're walking around saying, check out my ex, then you got, you probably got problems, right? Exactly. That could, yeah. like, you'd what be like, could hey, that you're, mean? you're okay? Like you should, they've moved on. Like, let them move on. It's like, you know, the head of the go. Spanish soccer federation. <laughs> check it, adjusting your ex. Oh, man. That guy's, <laughs> there'll, there'll, there'll be a lot of that. I'm glad we got into that with uh, Amy Walsh earlier and with Keith Law. Uh, we got to take a break on Overdrive, but uh, much more to come here. Uh, you're watching us on TSN 2, uh, listening on TSN 1050 and the iHeartRadio app. We were just talking in the last segment or a couple of segments ago about what is a, a baseball sound. I said Bruce Springsteen-ish. Uh, JP, what you've just played in our ears on TSN 1050 to come into this uh, last half hour on Overdrive. With myself, Brendan Dunlop, alongside Dave Festchuk from the Toronto Star. Um, that's what I would describe like wrestling music. To me, that's, that's, oh, yeah. that's definitely like wrestling interest music. If it had a sound, it would be whatever that was in my ear. A little bit of medley. 100%. Yeah, there's something... of. Right? There's something about it mentally. Like, has there ever been, like, a wrestling superstar that's been an EDM guy? I don't know. I'm not, a, I, like, I, my wrestling knowledge kind of is, is a bit dated. JP's probably a wrestling guy. He probably knows. I it, I'm not a new, like, more recent. I, I used to be an old school wrestling fan. Uh, I'm trying to think if there was anything. I can't, not, nothing off the top of the dome. 
There's something about the, that metal sound, though, that it's, it's perfectly suited, right? It oh, resonates yeah. in the arena. It gets people hyped up. And, and you can only tolerate it for, like, so long, though. Like, it's a good yeah. entrance roll-in, right? Probably it's working not like a, the underbed. Probably work in a football locker room, too. Getting, the, getting your linemen pumped up to go out there and battle in the trenches. It's a, who's the person that you see putting putting metal on, though? Like, Ron yeah. Jaworski? That's who I'm picturing. <laughs> He's getting you hyped. Like, do, 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 do. Oh! That's I'm the just, music that I'm just that thinking gets like going to kind of like linemen, you know, batting each other, you know, kind of butting heads, head butting each other in a kind of pregame ritual of some sort. Really kind of, I don't know. I could see it. Should we hype up the show? Uh, yeah. That way. Maybe in, Why in not? Between commercial breaks next time. All right. And the we'll, energy. We'll see how it plays. Keep the energy going. Uh, TSN 1050. Once again, delivering backpacks filled with school supplies to support local families. It's that time of year. Get ready to go back to school. This is all part of our ninth annual back to school backpacks event happening this Wednesday, August 23rd. This year's event presented by Healthy Planet. Together in partnership with the Children's Breakfast Clubs, 1,010 young students will receive the tools that they need to succeed before the school bell rings in September. For all the details, head on over to tsn1050.ca. We'll talk a little NFL shortly with uh, former NFL tight end Anthony Becht. Have you been watching much of, uh, well, not, not of, pardon me, not of the preseason, but have you been watching much of Hard Knocks this year? Because I actually thought I'd get sucked in more than I have been. You're not loving it? I haven't. Uh, I, I think I just haven't prioritized it in the day. I don't know if that's being the father of a five-month-old. Uh, yeah, or, you have a teething baby in your house. Could be that. I understand. That, that can cut into your sports watching. Right. And your, you know, paper. It's supplementary sports watching. Yeah. It hasn't affected the games as much as Okay. Sleep. You're still catching your but soccer. The, the supplementary sports content. Right. I think is dipped. I got gotcha. you. Well, you know, it, it, like this hard knocks, as much as there was all kinds of controversy coming into it with the Jets not wanting to do it and all the rest of it, like it, it hasn't really been like headline provoking. You know, there haven't been a lot of stories out of it. Mm. Well, let's ask uh, someone who knows the Jets very well. The uh, color commentator for the Jets preseason broadcast, the co-host of uh, New York Jets pre and post game shows as well. Former NFL tight end and St. Louis Battlehawks head coach of the XFL, Anthony Becht. Joins us on the line. Anthony, welcome to the show, man. Hey, what's up, guys? Good to be on. Great to chat with you. So uh, we're just talking about how the Jets haven't pulled us into hard knocks. Are we in the minority of people who uh, who aren't as swooned uh, by what's uh, what's to come with this New York Jets season? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's been good. I, you know, I think uh, you don't necessarily get a couple storylines as far as, like, you know, guys that are tracked, get released and stuff like that, fighting for the 50 53. I mean, it's just, those are the, you know, probably thrilling things and that people see and, and uh, not a lot of drama, but you know, episode three, maybe, maybe pretty good. There's some, some scuffles in practice this week. So or this past week with the bucks and I'm sure they'll, they'll add some of that stuff in there. But, um, you know, look, this team, I, you know, from, from what I've seen two weeks, it was at Carolina, watched the practices with them and with Tampa last um, you know, there's a lot of weapons on this team. The defense is, is going to be, uh, you know, they, they, they got a chance to be one of the best in, in the league. They were four last year overall. Uh, I, I, there's just so much depth right now in the defensive line. And you have arguably one of the best corner tandems with Sauce and, and Reader. I, I just, it's going to be hard, man. It's, it's going to be hard for, for, for offenses to, 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 to make and drive and, and do all these things they want to do uh, because of the pressure they're going to feel up front. And, and now you throw in Aaron Rodgers to lead an offense where he's mm-hmm. going to have pretty good field position. He's going to get the ball back, you know, more often than not. Um, you know, how quickly can they get up to speed and, and, and click? I think that's the biggest question. But, you know, I think right now, you know, this team's primed to, you know, be one of the better teams in the AFC. Where are you on Aaron Rodgers, uh Anthony, because obviously coming off a down year in Green Bay, now there was a thumb injury scattered in there, and we don't know exactly how much that affected his performance, but he was not you know, an MVP caliber quarterback with the Green Bay Packers last year after winning the award uh, in the two years prior. Age 39, all the New York attention and pressure that's inherent with that, how do you think he's going to react to it? Yeah, I'm not worried about the pressure stuff. I mean, you know, this guy's Hall of Famer and – you know, he's been in big, big games uh, over his career. Um, so that that's not something I'm concerned about. 
Um, you know, th- this team is, you can't compare his team last year and what he has to this team now. I mean, he's, he's got arguably the best running back tandem in the NFL. Um, you know, Brees Hall now back with Cook getting signed. Um, just tremendous, a lot of options for him with the backfield that he has. Um, receiver wise, you know, he's got his buddy Lazard and Cobb, but, you know, Garrett Wilson is a different dude. Like, he's a guy that the Jets receiving core have not had a guy like that in, you know, in a long time. I mean, you know, since I've been a part of the organization, you know, 23 years, I, I just haven't seen a guy that's uh, that's going to be as good as what he is if he's healthy and continues to, you know, take that upward climb. I just think he's an elite receiver, and, and Aaron's going to make him re- look really good this year. And, you know, deep at the tight end position, um, you know, everybody's talking about the offensive line. I'm not really concerned as much as many other people are. I think they have enough pieces to get it done. Uh, if you look at any line across the NFL, they all got issues. They're all looking for pieces. You don't get, you don't have the luxury to have five good players. It's just, you know, you're, you're going to take your hits. You get three good guys, you build, and you work around it, and then you fill those holes with running backs, tight ends, if they need to assist or wherever it may be. So, you know, I think Aaron Rodgers is in a really good place. He knows it, and uh, you know, right now he's, uh, you know, he's just building the camaraderie, building with his teammates, understanding who the, his players are, the organization, so that, you know, he can help them move forward and, and be as good as they can be starting week one. Aaron Rodgers is a very unique talent, obviously, and became a superstar in Green Bay, a place that's a very unique sporting market where someone of his ilk could get away with saying some things that I think in other markets maybe they couldn't. Um, what do you think uh, adjusting to life in New York will be like for, for Aaron Rodgers? You know what, man? I just watch him, you know, over the last two weeks. The guy just looks like he's in a great place. He looks like he's happy. Mm-hmm. I think he's, you know, he's maybe, you know, felt some some things over the last several years with the Green Bay Packers and the organization, the way he's been portrayed. I just think that, you know, it's been kind of a tipping point for him. I think now people are starting to see kind of what he's all about. I mean, uh, you know, I have multiple conversations with him about just, you know, why over 18 years we didn't get this – you know, the public, the media get to see this part of, you know, who he was. It's all this, all these things that I see him doing, mm. you know, building, building within the team. And he's been above and beyond everything the Jets thought they were getting. I think that uh, along with the 35 million off the back end of the contract to help uh, moving forward as well. So, uh, you know, he's in it to win it. I mean, he truly, it's, it's Super Bowl for him. That's his mindset as I, you know, just be, being around him for the last couple of weeks, like, you know, he, he's trying to get everybody mindset, uh, bearing any injuries, you know, moving forward, that this he feels like this team can make a push. And I just feel like the defense, to me, is is what's the difference maker here because the quarterback's always been a missing peach. People forget, the Jets were 5-2 and two last year with, with a healthy Brees Hall and Zach Wilson quarterbacking. You know, and then once he went down, it, it kind of went south, and, you know, you leaned on a quarterback that wasn't experienced. I mean, just think about that, you know, big picture. That's the de- that's what the defense allowed them to do with a running game. Now they got more pieces and a quarterback, arguably, you know, when he's at his peak and he's got pieces around him, is a top five guy. So, you know, he's going to have that. And, and that's what I fully expect out of him this season. So, uh, Anthony, it's been tough for running backs to get paid in this league. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about that uh, this season in particular. Uh, specifically around Jonathan Taylor of the Indianapolis Colts, who led the league in, in rushing a couple of years back and been seeking a contract extension with the Colts and hasn't been able to come to terms. The news today, Adam Schefter of ESPN reporting that the Colts are going to grant uh, Jonathan Taylor his wish and per- give him permission to seek a trade and speak to other teams, even though the owner only a few weeks back, the owner of the Colts, Jim Isray, said they would not trade this guy. What do you make of this saga, and uh, how do you think it's going to turn out for Jonathan Taylor and the Colts? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's kind of an enigma with this guy. I mean, he's a really good back. He's had some injuries, um, and you battle through those as teams. I just think you look at every team across the board. I mean, there's only some true elite guys, and the elite guys can do mo- do both. I mean, Alvin Kamara is the highest paid running back in the league. And rightfully so. He catches the ball like a receiver. He runs the ball like some of the best backs in the NFL do. You know, that, that complete package brings a lot to the table. And he's, uh, you know, for, from, from a running back standpoint, Christian McCaffrey's number two. I think, you know, what he brings as a complete back is, is different. And then you have your other backs. I mean, Derrick Henry probably overpaid for, for, for what 
you know, maybe you're looking for from a back, but they lean on him a lot more in their style of play. Um, you know, Taylor, I think just to me, should have just kept his head down and kept going. I just feel like once you lose the team that loved you and drafted you and embraced you, and now you start, you know, um, you know, feeling as if, you know, you, you need to be paid differently elite. You know, he's still, obviously, we're looking for a complete season out of him. It kind of just brings your value down. Guys just want to see him do his thing. Now, will he have gotten his market value if he if he kept his mouth kind of closed, put his head down and kept doing what he's doing and put another big year in that we saw his rookie season? You never know. I mean, you know, if it, if it proved to get them deep in the playoffs and, and make big moves as a team, that team's going to reward that player the best they can. Now, you know, he's going to go out there. And, yeah, Is there a need for him from another team? Absolutely. Is he going to get that contract that he wants? Probably not, but he'll get a contract, you know, whatever that may be. But, uh, you know, he's going to have to do it first with that team. And then once he does it, you know, to prove himself, then, you know, then it's going to start over again. You know, he's just not going to go somewhere if there's a trade and get a new contract. So, um, you know, look, he's in a tough spot. I think, uh, you know, running backs are really important depending on where you are and what you bring to the table. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they just – the Colts just feel like, you know, they can they can do it with other guys. And, you know, that's not a knock on him. It's just that that's their, their, their sentiment with it. And we'll see how it works out. I, I don't know, you know, where, where another team like the 49 – you know, they – they got a guy like Christian McCaffrey. Like where where can he go to get that value now? Or wherever he goes, I feel like everybody has that kind of a back that they need all the way into training camp where they're at right now. I don't know what those suitors will look like for him. So it's a difficult position. I think the best place for him was in Indy, but apparently mm-hmm. he just he doesn't feel that way. Uh, running backs are used so differently now, as you list there, that it used to be in the past. You have someone of that caliber. There was like 10 teams lining up for him, and now we're struggling to see, you know, speculate where the fit might be. Um, talking with Anthony Beck, former NFL tight end, and working with the New York Jets uh, broadcast and through this preseason. A lot of Buffalo Bills fans in this market, Anthony. Where are you on the Bills? Are you high or low on uh, them heading into this new season? Uh, they got some yeah, issues with the, the team, O-line. They're the team to beat. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the Jets have to go take it from them. I mean, that, mm. that's just what it is. I mean, the Bills have been the, the, the team in this division. Um, and, you know, you, you're going to get their best. I mean, they're not going to roll into New York, you know, uh, not prepared for what they're going to get. But, I, they, you know, the past has shown that, the, you know, they've had difficulties with this Jets defense, and it's a better defense now. You know, I think it's a top three, could be the top defense this season if everybody's healthy. That's the kind of players they got. And when their backups come in, it's just as scary because they just have good players and good depth. Um you know, look, I think it's going to be a, a great game. I hope it is. Um, you know, obviously, you come out the gates, you kind of hope offenses are quick, and it usually takes a little time for teams in general offensively. But, um, yeah, it's it's a huge matchup. Uh, it's going to end week one. I think a lot of folks are going to be intrigued by it. But, of course, Bill, Bills are the – you got to take it from the Bills, and that's the Jets and what their mindset should be, and it is, in my opinion – uh, for them to, you know, start their journey and be where they want to be. Well, the Bills, you know, last year kind of came into the season with a ton of pressure because there was there was talk that they were the presumptive Super Bowl favorites, right? And that hadn't happened in Buffalo for quite some time. This year, do you get the feeling, uh, Anthony, that they're a little more under the radar and, and that could benefit them? No, I don't. I think there's more pressure just because, you know, the expectation level was high and now it's kind of like, all right, like, internally in that building, whether it's the head coach with ownership or whoever that may be like, Hey, we got these players. We brought them in. We got all these guys in place. Okay. Our quarterback's been, been phenomenal. Like where, where's the result that we want? So I think, yeah, I think there's pressure. I, you know, there's pressure for every team, but when you're on top consistently for the last couple of years and you're not getting what you want, uh, you know, that, you know, that starts peaking, at some point. So I, I think there's just as much pressure on them as there ever was. I think, uh, you know, you got a head coach right now that's gotten a team where you want them to be, but now it's like, can we get over the hump? So, uh, yeah, man, I mean, uh, you know, they should be feeling, feeling it in general. And, and, you know, this, this, this is a division that has loaded up around what they have done. You know, it was kind of like, okay, they got their pieces. They took it away from new England, but you know, you look at Miami, the jets, a little bit with New England, like they're adding pieces to compete and it's making it difficult now because of those years 
uh, that they haven't been able to take that step. So it's, it's going to be even harder now uh, just because of, per se, what the Jets have done. And, you know, Miami feels like they've added some really good pieces as well. So mm-hmm. it's not an easy hike. And uh, I, I think it's the, the pressure is just as high as it's ever been for the Bills. That division is going to be fun to watch, but yeah, they are going to beat each other up, and it's uh, you know it's it, it's going to be tough. But I, I agree that the uh, you know the, the Bills are the team that everybody else is catching. Um, Anthony, this is great to talk with you. I'll be honest, this has hyped me up more for this NFL season chatting with you, Anthony, than Hard Knocks did. <laughs> oh, so, good. Yeah, I appreciate you, man. Great. Thanks for coming on Overdrive and uh, enjoy the season. Look forward to hearing you on the Jets broadcast, and hopefully speak to you again soon. All right, guys, have a good one. Thanks. Anthony Beck there, uh, making a lot of uh, Aaron Rodgers backers or anyone who's got Aaron Rodgers on their fantasy team feeling uh, a little more confident maybe than before the conversation. Yeah. Maybe he's high on Rodgers. He's high on, on this Jets team. And look, we, we've seen, you know, when Rodgers has had good defenses and he didn't have them very often in Green Bay. No, he but, didn't. But I think the one year that they won the Super Bowl, they had a top 10 defense and he delivered when he had it. Mm-hmm. So if this is one of the elite defenses in the NFL, like – and Rodgers is even a kind of a reasonable facsimile of what he was in his MVP seasons. That they could be dangerous. But also in those years where he was, maybe not the last MVP season, but uh, certainly when they went to the Super Bowl um, and they were stronger overall, he was having fun. Yeah, it was noticeable. He was. He was. He didn't seem to be as cantankerous as he can be at times when the camera lights come on. And as Anthony said, there, you know, he's he's showing a different side to that the local media. Um, and he's, he's showing a side amongst that team, like he's he's there to win and he's ready to win. And it's you know the wheels haven't fallen off. He's, well, he's still got the arm. He's still 39 years old though, he man. He is though, man. In this NFL, I know, I know. But uh, there's a lot to be said about being happy in your situation. Mm-hmm. And if he wasn't happy, which we're all led to believe for the last few years, may explain why the seasons went the way they did for the Packers to well, a degree. Look, man. Yeah, I'm not sure what he wasn't happy about. Like the. I know the guy that usually sits in that chair has some strong opinions about the fact that Aaron Rodgers was a malcontent on right. a team that did everything they could to make him happy. To make him happy, and and it was never enough. Mm-hmm. So there is that. And and look, as much as we just had Albert uh, Anthony on, and and Anthony's, you know, he's doing Jets pre and post game, and he's he's high on the Jets, which is part of the gig. I mean, they're still the Jets, man. Everybody else, <laughs> when you're in the Jet machine. Yeah, they're the proud New York Jets, but when you're outside the Jets machine, they're the New York Jets. Like you talk about teams that'll find a way to screw things up. They've it's got a pretty usually, good track record. It's usually the Jets, but different ball game now. They yeah. got uh, they got one of the best maybe, quarterbacks. Or maybe ever. they don't have a line to protect them and it's gonna be a disaster. Or maybe they don't. But that's why we watch the games, Dave, which is the, the beautiful part of it. Well, continue watching and listening to Overdrive as uh, we still got more to come here on TSN two, the TSN radio ten fifty and the iHeartRadio app. Talking about the feelings you get from listening to music, right? There's some music that just sets you up, like metal, wrestling, right? Or uh, NFL uh, linebackers meeting, uh, line up meeting, which is what Dave said. Um, that sound to me says gambling. That song is, I, I am ready to play some bets. Am I, I am, right? I am amped up to win some money. Is that what you're, <laughs> is that what you're saying, Brendan? That's the feeling. Loving. That's the what you know. What odds is FanDuel giving me tonight, Grappler? That's the feeling. <laughs> well, I, I gotta be honest here. I am very frustrated with how my selections for today had played out. So oh, why? Well, so I I file our best bets uh, earlier in the day to our friends at FanDuel, and earlier today my selections included the Reds money line versus the Angels tonight. That game was then postponed due to the, due to the what is it Hurricane Hillary out there. Mm-hmm. So I pivoted and switched to uh, Red Sox Astros on the money line, which I'm still going to do. But also my selections included Julio Rodriguez of the Mariners to get a hit. Oh. Look at the lineup a few minutes ago out of the lineup. So Uh-oh. I can't I can't exactly say that these best bets were necessarily my first picks, but uh, we're still going to try and make people some money here. So today's best bets are powered by FanDuel. Make your picks and assemble a same game parlay in seconds on the FanDuel Sportsbook app. As I mentioned, um, I have the Red Sox on the money line versus the Astros. Uh, Red Sox just swept the Yankees. Astros were just swept by the Mariners, so two teams kind of heading in different directions. Uh, got Rafael Devers to record a hit as well. And I have the Mariners on the uh, run line, uh, which is minus 1.5 versus the uh, lowly Chicago White Sox. Um, plus money there, plus 348. Today's best bets are powered by FanDuel. The first inning, inning means as much as the ninth when you bet baseball on the FanDuel Sportsbook app. Please Pay responsibly at 19 plus and physically located in Ontario.
Uh, working with what you got, Grappler. Nicely done. Uh, Dave, we did three hours of radio. I think I mentioned Lionel Messi's name once. We didn't even get into how oh. he won a trophy in his first uh, tournament. His Brendan, first I'm impressed. I, you, you, mentioned, you mentioned him pretty much just to say that you were going to mention him. Right. And then he never came up again. It's quite impressive. Oh, man. It's shocking, isn't it? We'll, we'll Tomorrow's going to be a different beast, yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I imagine so. We'll see if uh, well, if we got a new coach to talk about uh, in Toronto. There'll certainly be a different beast. That could be uh, a situation, according to our friend Josh well, Polk. The hot question that we got to get into is, is Messi making a mockery of MLS by scoring, what, 10 goals in his first seven games? Making a mockery or elevating the level, my friend. Oh, okay. You know, we can, we Messi, can agree to disagree the ma- on magician, that. He's, uh, it's ve- soccer is not an individual sport, but somehow one man has done things that we've never seen before. And you can say that that makes the league look bad. I say it just makes me want to watch more. Oh, I like watching it. I'm just not sure exactly what I'm watching. Well, maybe we'll get into it tomorrow, my friend, because we're running out of time today. Thanks for joining us on Overdrive. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.